Your style sheets are bloated and making a mess. Your HTML is ashamed of your CSS. It's not organized and it's not classy. It's time to make your style sheets sassy. Using CSS extensions are the preference. We'll use mixed ends, nest and an inheritance. Functions extend and partials will amass. In no time you'll be assembling sass. I'm Nick Walsh and welcome to Assembling SAS Level 1 Foundation. In Level 1 we'll be discussing why adding SAS to our workflow is advantageous and then talk about how we can change our CSS to the SAS syntax including comments, importing, and nesting. So first up let's talk a bit about CSS. Now CSS was designed to be simple and largely it is but at size we start to run into some issues. Uh, throughout our large style sheets we'll have slight variations of colors, numbers, and properties that become incredibly difficult to change over time, like if we wanted to change all shades of blue to a red. Also, we have problems curbing our petition as our style sheet size grows. It's harder and harder to know where to put new styles as things get very large. Also, base CSS has no good way to go about handling multiple style sheets. So either we have to take a performance hit or we have one really large style sheet. So because of these problems, SAS comes in very handy. Now SAS stands for Syntactically Awesome Style Sheets. And it looks a lot like CSS, but adds a lot of extra stuff on top to help combat these aforementioned issues. Now SAS is a preprocessor, kind of like CoffeeScript and Haml if you're familiar with those. So we're going to be starting with a SAS file. When we save it, it'll run through a SAS compiler. And finally, a CSS file will be output so the browser can read it. So real quick, a bit of history on SAS. SAS was created by Hampton Catlin. He's also the creator of Haml, and he wanted to bring the terse syntax Haml brings to HTML to CSS as well. Uh, the primary developers on the project have been Nathan Weizenbaum and Chris Epstein. And if you're fortunate enough to work in Rails, it's already baked into the asset pipeline. Now, a lot of people write SAS in all caps. Uh, so it's important to note, if you want to be taken seriously when saying SAS, only capitalize the first letter. Hampton has said before he likes to intentionally not have shouty acronyms on his projects. Let's start off talking a bit about file extensions. .scss, or sassy CSS, is the default file extension for SAS. CSS doubles as valid SCSS, so when starting off, you're able to take any CSS you would normally write, save it as .scss, and it compiles normally into SAS. Also, there's a second syntax called the indented syntax that's available as SAS, but in the course, we're gonna to stick to the default of SASE CSS. So in this course, we're going to be discussing a lot of SCSS code and then seeing what it compiles down to in CSS. Whenever we have to show SCSS code, it'll look something like this. And then we compile it down to normal CSS, we'll represent it like this. Don't worry too much about the stuff in here you don't know yet. We'll be covering what all this means later in the course. So as we said before, since CSS doubles as valid as CSS, we definitely recommend that you go ahead and write styles like you're used to and slowly incorporate new techniques as you go. You might get a little bogged down if you try to incorporate everything at once. So our first conversion from CSS to SAS is gonna be through comments. In SAS, we're afforded a second way to denote comments, double slash single line comments. These type of comments in SAS aren't compiled down to normal CSS. So in this case, we see we have normal CSS comments following our single line SAS comments. And when it's compiled down to normal CSS, the SAS comments no longer appear. These comments come in exceptionally handy when you're trying to separate out your CSS document as those cosmetic comments aren't necessary for the final product. As we've mentioned before, it's a bit difficult to deal with multiple files in CSS. We're afforded either using multiple link tags or using the at import rule. But historically, we've avoided using the at import rule because it's not very performant. The style sheets can't download in tandem, and we have to wait for everything to load before any styles are shown to the browser. When we use SAS, though, the add import rule is slightly different. We can import files that end in .scss or .sass, and that importing happens during compile time instead of on the client side. Also, using the add import rule with SAS, we don't have to include a file extension. In this case, we have our application.scss file, and we're importing the buttons.scss file. 
during compile time, the application.scss file compiles down to application.css and during compile the buttons.scss file is imported into application.scss which ultimately becomes part of application.css. However, when we have a separate buttons.scss file, the compiler goes ahead and makes a separate buttons.css file even though we're already importing it into application. Now if we only want to include buttons.scss as an import of applications, this is a bit of a problem. We don't need that extra style sheet. To combat this in SAS, we're able to create partials. So we can rewrite our buttons.scss file as a partial by starting it with an underscore. Once we add the underscore, it's still imported into application.scss normally, but a button.css file is no longer created. So back in our application.scss file, we don't have to change anything with our import. The import looks for the files that I've specified here in the comments, so we're still good to go with our new partial. Now that we laid the groundwork, let's start getting into the really useful bits of SAS. First up is nesting. So as you start writing CSS, you're going to notice some patterns with your selectors. In this case, we have a content declaration, and we also have scoped P and H2 declarations to go along with it. So let's go ahead and convert this over to a SAS file by copying the same contents over. Using SAS, we're able to nest these properties instead of defining them separately. So we have our content declaration, and then inside of that, we're going to nest our H2 and our P. At compile time, it's going to go ahead and scope those as we initially had in our normal CSS. Less common, but occasionally useful, is the ability to nest certain types of properties with matching namespaces. In this case, we have our text decoration and text underline properties nested together, and when it compiles, it will compile down to those specific properties. We can use this for things like border and font as well. Another useful feature while we're nesting is the ampersand, or the parent selector. So normally, if we have our callout block scoped inside of our content block, it has a space when it creates that selector. If we use the ampersand in front of our callout block, when it compiles, it uses that reference to our initial parent selector, content, to create a compound selector with no space in between. The difference between these two declarations, as you may know, is that the first callout that's scoped inside of content looks for a container that has a class of callout inside of a container that has a class of content, whereas the second looks for a container that has both classes at the same time. Using the parent selector is exceedingly useful in cases where we need to have pseudo classes and pseudo elements like anchors. Here I want to set an active state and a hover state for my anchor so I can use the parent selector to go ahead and reference that anchor as we move down and set new styles for those states. So with this parent selector reference, we're not limited to using it as the first part of a selector. With this bit of basic CSS, you can see we have a sidebar declaration, and then later we want to scope it to user to change it slightly. However, we're changing sidebar in a second scoping, things are disconnected, and really it's not quite as coupled as we want it to be. So using our parent selector reference, we're able to nest this change into our sidebar declaration in SAS. We can go ahead and scope that user's change inside our ampersand character for the parent selector references dot sidebar. And we use the user selector first so that when it compiles, it compiles to that same bit of CSS that we had before. So take note that when you nest and combine the parent selector, the parent selector reference context carries through depending on your nesting. So this ampersand here, since it's found inside of a nested H2 in our sidebar declaration, has the reference of sidebar H2. So when we compile it, as you can see, it compiles down to users sidebar H2 because of that nesting context. So as you can see, nesting is very easy and really helps clean up our code, but it's dangerous. SAS adds a lot of extra functionality and is very useful, but it doesn't help us write good CSS. You should always check your nesting to make sure you're not adding nesting levels unnecessarily as that will increase the specificity of your selectors far too much. And here's what I mean by that. In this case, we're nesting everything down to the hover state for our anchor. When you see the compiled CSS, we have a four level deep selector 
and this specificity is incredibly hard to override later. So as a tip, try limiting your nesting to three or four levels, and if you have to go deeper, consider refactoring your code to make use of extra classes. All right, you've made it to the end of level one, and it's time to get started on the challenges. Make sure you reference the slides as you move through the challenges, and definitely feel free to use the hints if necessary. We don't want you to get stuck in any one place for too long. Good luck.